Howdy friends! So this video, as you've gathered by the title, is going to involve just a, a look at these three Golden Dawn inspired decks. And I say Golden Dawn inspired decks because in essence that's what they are. So um, what we've got in front of us is the Golden Dawn Tarot by Robert Wang and uh, Dr. Israel Regardi, the famous Crowley Toth Tarot, and then the Golden Dawn Magical Tarot by uh, Sandra Tabitha Cicero and, and Chick Cicero. Um, also evidently in collaboration with Israel Ricardi before he died. So I say they're inspired because they are all in their way Golden Dawn decks, but of course the Golden Dawn Tarot um, is, is to my understanding, sort of lost to the ages, as it were. Um, the the story goes that when you reached a certain level of the Golden Dawn, you were given a copy of the deck that was painted by or drawn by um, uh, Moina Mathers, and uh, the initiates were instructed to create their own copy of it. And uh, that's, that's what they would do. And that lives on in some uh, forms through organizations like the Builders of the Adidum, I think, is one where you don't necessarily redraw the deck, but you color it. And and that's also become a part of Benabel Wen's Spirit Keeper's Tarot um, with the ritual coloring of the images in the guidebook. So um, over the years, I've been asked to talk about the Crowley deck, and I don't do it um, <laughs> for various reasons. One is that it's just not a system I work with. Um, it's it's not something I've studied and over the years I've found uh, Crowley to be suitably frustrating a character uh, to be turned off by him. <laughs> um, and as as if you if you've watched my channel you know too that I don't have a super um, uh, esoteric relationship to the cards. Now I did a video um, about the Wait Smith pips, about Pixie's pips, and in, in, in that I sort of hinted to the fact that really all tarot is in a sense esoteric because it all stems tarot as we understand it today um, in the United States and in the UK largely stems from the Golden Dawn. So even though you look at the Waite Smith deck in comparison to the three we're going to look at, they look very different, that emerged out of Waite's understandings and his uh, rectifications, as he would say, of, of their associations and their systems. And probably some obfuscation, too, right? Because, of course, the only person who was really interested in revealing all the secrets of the Golden Dawn was, was Crowley, who was the first person to publish them. So, um, but I don't read that way, um, you know, I mean, though it's been an influence on me, the things I don't, you know, I don't do a lot of the things, I don't uh, practice a lot of the spiritual aspects that folks do with tarot, um, not for any bias, just because it's not what I do. It's not the way I work. So my, I'm very much a reader. I'm very much about the day-to-day -day stuff. That's what I needed, and that's what's useful for me. So I haven't even really studied, well that's actually a lie, I have studied quite a bit about the history of tarot and, and its esoteric relationship. So I've, I've read, um, and these are, these are, I probably should grab these books at some point and talk about them. So there's a wicked pack of cards, um, I, uh, uh, I really should remember to find these things, uh, and I can see it, and <laughs> it's, um, uh, Ronald Decker, Terry DePaulis, and Michael DeMette. And then, so that is sort of a pre-occult history of tarot. And then, and then there's, they, there's a follow-up with two of those writers uh, called A History of the Occult Tarot. Both of them are really interesting, but both of them are really academic works. They're really dry works. The second one, The History of the Occult Tarot, is actually a little more interesting because it does have a huge section that explores the Golden Dawn and how it got that way uh, and how it fractured, etc. So uh, for, for a tarot student who's interested in history, I would recommend both of those books. I think A Wicked Pack of Cards is out of print, but I found it online pretty easily. And then um, A History of the Occult Tarot is 
uh, is still available. I've got a, a copy of it new. They are dry reads though. So I have studied the occult tarot. Um, I also read recently, um, just because I had the time to do it after I finished school, uh, Lan Myla Duquette's great book about the, the Crowley Thoth tarot, Thoth, Thoth, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so to say I haven't studied it is is not true. I it just a lot of it doesn't resonate with me, and it doesn't. Uh, it's not how I work. Um, but I have gotten requests over the years to talk about the Crowley deck uh, and various Golden Dawn systems and decks. Uh, and honestly, one of the reasons why I haven't is not because I haven't studied it. I have. It's because I honestly don't want to um, deal with the comments I'm going to get from you know quote experts on the system. I am not an expert on the Golden Dawn, although I've probably read more about it than a lot of people have. Um, uh, and I'm not an expert on Crowley. I'm also not a fan of his. Um, and, you know, I think in Lon Milo Duquette's book, he makes a, a nice case for Crowley. But all it does is make me like Lon Milo Duquette. So I don't like Crowley more than I did before. Um, I... I what it really did was give me a huge amount of respect for Lady for Lady Frida Harris and her artwork, which I've always admired and I've always loved the images on Crowley's deck. Um, but to me, it really is the Frida Harris deck because uh, I really only appreciate it from that point of view. I do not. So the other thing. So this this first deck um, by Robert Wang. He's he's a pretty well known author in the occult tarot world, and probably his most famous publication is the Kabbalistic Tarot, which I have also read most of. Uh, it again is not an easy read, and it's huge. It's it's a big hardcover. It looks like a college textbook, and it's really dense. And there's a lot of information in there. But of course, he knows what he's talking about. And he has several books, including a larger book about this particular deck, which I have not read. Um, so I guess to say that I haven't studied it was a lot, because I've read quite a lot about the Golden Dawn and the history of Tarot and how it got where it is and how Waite did what he did and Crowley did what he, what he did. And, um, I, you know, I've attempted to understand the Kabbalistic associations. I've taken the audio course through the Tarot School. I've attempted gamely to make it through Robert Wang's book. Um, it's all just a little beyond me, and ultimately, for me personally, I find it getting in the way. Um, so that's to say I'm not an expert, although I have read a lot. What I have discovered, and this is purely bias, is that there are a lot of Crowley fans out there who wait for videos like this to pop up and um, to school the maker because they know more than I, the maker does. Um, so I guess that's one reason I've avoided even talking about it. Uh, in fact, I think I got smacked once or twice in my Pixies Pips video because I reference Crowley's keywords for the cards. So um, I have avoided ever talking about Crowley because his energy seems to permeate people who want to argue. Uh, so I guess that's my way of saying like this is purely for informational purposes. It's purely for aesthetic purposes. Um, if you are interested in arguing about Crowley and his worth or what he meant, um, I, you've come to the wrong place. Frankly, I don't even think Crowley knew what he was talking about half the time, and I think he knew that. Um, but that's just me, so I'm clearly not a fan. What I'm here mostly to talk about today is the artwork and to show you three iterations of a deck that, un you know, the, the White Smith deck, which we all know and love slash hate, uh, is a Golden Dawn deck by my estimation, but departs in almost every way. Because of course, Waite was both interested in obfuscating what uh, he wanted to keep secret and, um, uh, and and changing what he thought was wrong. I think his decision to change the miners so dramatically is kind of mind blowing. And I would love to know what he was thinking in, in making that change. Um, but brilliant, and he changed, you know, he and Pixie changed the world of tarot. And I think without that deck, we probably wouldn't be talking, I certainly wouldn't be talking about it today, uh, about tarot. So that was our entry point for a lot of us. Now, the reason that I'm talking about the way he changed things and why these, to me, are more, more Golden Dawn is that they are more um, based on what would evidently have been Moyna Mather's 
um, paintings of the original deck. Um, now there are many Golden Dawn based decks out there. These are the three that I think are um, uh, the most easily available. Now this I thought was out of print, but it's not. I, I don't think. I think it has a new packaging. This is still in print, and obviously this is still in print. Um, there are a lot of different versions of this one. This is the AGM edition, which I got on eBay. It's hard to get the AGM, but when I asked which edition I should get, this was the one that people sort of universally said. And it really is a nice printing. I think this is the standard size. I mean, the Crowley deck, there's so many different sizes of. Um, but what I thought I would do is, like, let's look at all three together and compare and contrast and just sort of chat about them. And then, um, uh, you, you know, if you're looking for one, you'll find one. And if you don't like them, you'll not like them. And we'll go on our merry way. Um, and then uh, anyone who wants to argue with Crowley um, or about Crowley can do that with someone who gives a shit. <laughs> I don't mean to sound flip, but I just don't care. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, I'm. If you know everything about him and his system, then I say bravo to you. Um, and I'm not interested in learning about it. And at the point where I become interested in it, if I do, I will seek out resources on my own rather than people who want to yell at me on the internet because I generally don't find that volume equals credibility in my experience. Um, so, not to be... Well, I, you know, I'm not going to apologize for being flip about that shit. The people who aren't going to yell at me don't care, and the people who are probably don't care either. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, existing in, in the world lately. Um, so, let us talk about these decks. Um, there is, so the first one that I have laid out here, again, this is Robert Wang's uh, Golden Dawn Tarot, which uh, evidently was made in consort, at least, with Israel Rigardi, who famously sort of published all of the Golden Dawn texts uh, in the 30s and 40s, I believe. There is a larger book that Robert Wang wrote for this. Um, the, the little white book in it just gives a little bit of history and then it gives Mathers, uh, or what is evidently Mathers, brief descriptions of the cards. The Thoth deck comes with a little white book. There are several books about this that deck that you can find in the world. And then this Golden Dawn Magic, now again, I am 99% sure this is still in print, although I think the box has changed. This to me was like the golden time of Llewellyn packaging. Um, the World Spirit deck came this way. The Nigel Jackson, which is a deck I gave away, I traded, but loved. Uh, I just never used it. It came in like this great little box. Um, it came with the deck in a box that was fairly reusable. And then the book was uh, probably about as, as full as you get with a lot of guidebooks. Just not a lot of images in white space, but everything fit together nicely and it fit on the shelf. So I really miss those days of those sort of I think they called them mini kits. But I loved that idea. I thought they were so smart. It was such good packaging. Um, so, you know, again, I, we're going to look at these cards together and just explore. Um, and you're going to see that I've sort of bookended the, um, the, the Crowley deck with these two more go traditionally Golden Dawn decks. Principally because Crowley departed uh, in many ways as much as Waite did from the tradition. Um, so uh, here we've got the 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 cards, the backs. Um, the, this is the famous back uh, for obviously Crowley's deck. Um, Lon Milo Duquet in his book does a really great study of this back, um, and I think that this the Robert Wang version of it takes it to another level. Now here's something um, it, that's worth knowing. You know, I mean, there's a swastika which, up until the Third Reich in Germany, was a fairly common symbol in many cultures for various reasons and um, including fabric that was milled in my hometown in Massachusetts. Uh, it's got uh, um, esoteric history, it's got Buddhist history, it's, it's out there, but it is so jarring to see um, in any context now that I really you know, I, I wish there was some sort of variable that could be applied. I think once 
once you know uh, something like that I don't know. I, again, maybe I'm just oversensitive. I'm sure people will have comments about that. So um, you're going to note there's probably a lot more similarity between these two. Um, the interesting thing about this deck was, again, it was also made in concert, evidently, with Israel Regardi. Um, uh, he sort of approved and commissioned about 10 days before he died. But what's interesting in these little sort of like bitchy, backbitey things that crack me up. So in the little guidebook for this deck, the authors talk about how Israel Rigardi wasn't really happy with any of the ex extant decks, um, which sort of assumes this one, which he apparently worked on with, with Robert Wang. So there's bitchiness everywhere we go, right? All right, so here's the Fool card. Um, I'm not gonna have a whole lot of commentary. This really is, in many ways, a walkthrough um, with attendant ramblings and um, my own sort of projected uh, desire to not be schooled by anybody about Crowley. Um, so as we go through, I think you'll see, artistically, I actually really prefer this deck from this one, although this one does sort of feel a little, um, I don't know, it has like a, a sort of magical feel to it that is interesting. It's got a handmade feel to it. This feels a little more professional. I, I've i always loved the paintings, and I had no idea that they were watercolor. Knowing that the watercolor that Frida Harris was painting in watercolor makes me love it even more. All right, so here's The Fool. Um, the uh, Robert Wang deck, by and large, does not have the um, Hebrew letters associated with them. These two do. Uh, also, you can see, I think, the influence of the Crowley deck on this one because these very strange borders seem to be related to the um, the newer printings. I have seen older printings of the Crowley deck without that sort of butterfly web um, border. It's very deco. I don't really mind it all that much, to be honest. There are printings of it where the color is kind of ugly. On this particular one, I, I, I don't, it doesn't bog me at all. Um, I have seen it trimmed. I think it looks great. I probably won't trim any of these because I also probably won't use them that much. This is really just part of my own study and sort of having read about the Golden Dawn tradition, seeing what they look like um, in interpretations. All right, so let us move on to the Magician. Um, and again, you'll see throughout that the the uh, Thoth deck will be very different. Um, you do get um, a lot of similarities here with the with the majors, and the minors will go by really quickly. Um, so there are uh, astrological on both. Um, so you have Mercury here, Mercury there. Um, so you you sort of get. Uh, the same thing, but again, so, so, so different. Oh, and he obviously has the astrological associations. The High Priestess is such an interesting card, um, and I think in this case you can see that they were more influenced by Crowley here. Um, this is one of my favorite of her drawings, uh, her paintings. You know, just from from a stylistic standpoint, I do kind of like the richness and the, the life in these. Um, so this newer version, I, I sort of prefer to this one. Um, not wild about these backs, to be honest. They just feel a little sort of like a band from the 80s. I'm very, like, snarky today, aren't I? I've, I've, pre I've preempted any attacks that I'll get <laughs> with snark. Um, so here's the emperor. But again, you, they're very similar. Um, what's interesting is that on this deck, you don't always have the uh, full uh, realization of the uh, uh, astrological and the um, uh, Hebrew letters. So, uh, and of course, Crowley changed things or, or reassigned them based on his preferences. Um, but, you know, you can see Aries here, Aries here. You get Aries with the ram and the emperor, but you don't, you don't have the actual sort of glyph. Artistically, of the three, I actually really adore 
Frida Harris's art. I think it's so full of life. Um, and I would recommend actually Lon Milo Duquette's book if you are interested in exploring this deck, because he really does say, you know, here's what these animals mean. Here's what these lines mean. Here's why they're where they are. And so I think, you know, if you want to, I think you can, oh, frankly, I think you can read however you want with whatever you want. Um, but if you are if you are interested in exploring his book uh, or this deck and sort of why things are what they are, I would skip Crowley to start with and go right to Lon Milo Duquette's book. A new edition just came out. I'd bring it out and show you, but I actually read it on my iPad um, because I'm running out of space for books. Uh, I just moved and I'm already running out of space. Um, uh, so anyway, I just I I really am a fan of her art on this deck. It's always been one of my favorites. Um, now there is a story of this card, and I want I meant to actually research um, what it is, uh, and I knew at one time, and as happens, it flies out of my head. Um, It doesn't say there is I there is like a myth mythological story that this is depicting and it's not gonna tell me in here oh yes Perseus and Andromeda the rock of chains of material bondage um, thank you thank you little book Perseus and Andromeda um, so the, this lover's card is so, I mean, the Golden Dawn lover's card, even now, you know, when we think a, a deck has Golden Dawn influences, this is so specifically Golden Dawn. Obviously Crowley, obviously Wait did not use that same mythological um, uh, uh, story as the, as the basis for this card. Now, this is one of the earliest images of tarot I ever saw in a book, one of my early books. Um, I saw this lover's card and I, I've always really loved handmade art. And I remember thinking like, what a weird painting. But the fact that it's so clearly a painting has always made me interested. So when I got this deck recently, and I got this deck just to make this video, honestly, um, because I wanted to compare these two. I was originally going to do just these two, but I thought, oh, let's do let's do three Golden Dawn decks um, and to see how they are connected. And then this could be a useful, if long, video for anyone who sort of is trying to decide which one they want. The uh, Again, just to go back to the Crowley deck for a second, the, the nice thing, again, about Lon, Lon Milo Duquette's book is that there's, um, there's kind of a fairy tale that he tells, a Kabbalistic fairy tale that... Um, uses the images in these cards to uh to sort of explain the evolution through the stages of the majors uh and i think again i can't recommend that book enough if you are interested in golden dawn and crowley in particular but i think um i think it, it can go a long way to help under, it certainly helped me understand. And even the mnemonics that, you know, I, I read that book relatively quickly as I do, uh, just as a way of understanding, because I was like, okay, I've studied Marseille, I've studied Wade Smith, I've studied all these different things, let's look at Crowley for a bit. Um, and so the way he writes that book and the mnemonics that he sort of covertly creates do help you remember the evolution, because now I'm remembering the fairy tale that he tells um, about the the majors. So now we move on to the chariot. Um, artistically, again, uh, I really do like the life in this deck. I like the art style. Um, this is a, this is just a really attractive deck. I did get this used, I should say, um, cheaply, but again, I think you can get it new. Um, so there's the chariot. The chariot is my birth card. It's my numerological card, so it's always one I'm interested in. Um, here's Strength, which of course 8 became Adjustment in uh, in Crowley. And again, LMD does a great job explaining why. The Hermit. Um, again, I feel like you can see the influence of Frida Harris on this deck. Uh, I've always loved the Hermit card in this in this image um i feel like you can get a sense of it here um 
and again, you're getting the astrological associations uh, here um, along with the Hebrew letters, not so much here. So uh, if that matters to you, then I think by and large, you're going to find it more consistently in, in both of these, uh, etc. So you can see Virgo there. So the wheel, uh, which uh, Crowley changed to fortune. We'll go through the, the minors more quickly because they really are pip decks. Um, so justice or 11 became lust. Um, and again, uh, Lon Milo Duquette does a nice job sort of explaining, justifying, um, <laughs> easing us into Crowley's way of thinking here. Again, his book really made me appreciate him less, uh, more so than, than Crowley, but again, that, that I just have a bias there. Um, he just could be a nasty man. <laughs> and clearly so can I. So here we have the hanged man. This is very particular and so different from the others. I wonder if the guidebook gives us a, uh, a reference here. a little cartoony <laughs> here uh, I've always thought but again I feel like you can see the influence of Crowley in there temperance another one of Frida Harris I think's most beautiful paintings an interesting character Lady Frida Harris I'd love to see someone write a book about her Oh, there are two temperance cards in this deck. Pretty traditional devils here. And then, of course, Crowley's. Tower cards are always among my favorite. Isn't that weird? Um, <laughs> like, I kind of love all of these. The star. Beautiful. You know, again, the thing that's always kept me from working with the Crowley deck is Crowley and the use of the esoteric titles on the cards, which I don't like. We, we all know how I feel about keywords on cards. Um, so here's the moon. I think Again, you can see some influence here with the Egyptian um, callbacks. The sun. This one's a little less creepy in that they look like adults rather than children, but this is really gorgeous. So judgment. Which Crowley changed to the Eon. Again, you can understand more about why when you read uh, Lon Milo Duquette's book, which if again, if you want to work with this deck or even just see if it's for you, I would start with that book. Um, and then we get to the universe. And so those are the trumps, the keys, the majors uh, for these three decks. Now, these are um, pip decks. And... Um, so we can move through them really quickly. Now, th I, some would argue that this is the Crowley deck is not a pip deck, and I and I, I can see that. Although I, you know, knowing me, I would read them that way, um, just because of the fact that the energy. Actually, one of the reasons why I I decided to look at this deck again was because what I one of the things I like if I'm not using a Marseille style deck is for the pips to have life to them to have an energy uh, that's evocative uh, even if I'm not responding exactly to the um, the cards uh, intended meaning all right so here we have the aces um, 
Now, this, the pips in Robert Wang's deck are very, very simple and very consistent. Um, and they make me really curious. These are, again, they have more sort of associations, more life to them, more energy. Uh, so I do feel like these were influenced a bit more by Crowley, to be honest. But there's something nice about the simplicity of, of Robert Wang's deck. Um, now, this deck has the by and large the traditional esoteric golden dawn titles um which crowley used and abused and adapted uh these have none but you can see kind of the influences on the cards even down to the fact that he has the sun and aries and you've got the sun and aries on the the, the cards there um uh, not universal, but there you go. Again, so, so there's like Venus and Aries. Venus and... Uh, yeah, that's Venus. Um, sorry, I've never really <laughs> remembered all the glyphs for the, um, the signs and the planets. So Leo, I have always known. Saturn. Um, so this is the Seven of Wands. Now you can see there's a consistency across this. So um, Crowley and Frida Harris really worked with color associations, energy and layering, etc. Um, this probably does too, but different differently. So the color scheme in the Crowley deck changes. This one doesn't, and then this doesn't really have any color correspondence. It seems like. Um, so here we get to the seven. Mars and Leo, you got both of them there. Here, there is a connection in the setup. Um, yeah. <laughs> Isn't Frida Harris talented like the, the paintings are so beautiful i mean when we get into the pips the only one that i would really want to spend a lot of time with is is this one because of the life in those cards they're gorgeous so now we get into the court of wands and the titles are the same so we have princess across the board um and then prince and then queen This looks a little Shira to me. And then King. Well, actually, no. Um, so Crowley made it Knight, of course. I, I was expecting these to be Knight too, but they're not. So these are both, so the Kings are Kings. So we have Princess, um, Knight, Queen, and King. And then we get into the Suit of Cups. So the color scheme changes for the Golden Dawn Magical Tarot, not really for Robert Wang's. And of course, uh, Frida Harris um, is really working with individual associations throughout. So I'll go through a little bit more quickly. In this deck, the Suit of Cups is a little more interesting, but they're, they're very related here between these two decks. And here we have a very sort of consistent failing across the board. So it's, it's always interesting for me to study these things, especially when looking at the weight deck and the Crowley deck to look at things. Now, both of these decks were created after, but theoretically are based on the original Golden Dawn cards um, that members would have to paint or draw a copy of their own. Probably things changed, you know, as they do in like a game of telephone over the years. Um, things got adjusted or adapted by preference. But what's always curious and interesting to me is where there's overlap across a system, you know, or where Crowley, for example, was giving us really what probably was a Golden Dawn thing and where he changed things for his own interests. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really fast, that's one reason why I do things like this, because it's sort of like, oh, like, 
here he's serving us what probably would have really been there and here he's probably departing because they look the same in these two more traditional golden dawn decks and not in his and so clearly frida harris would have seen moina mather's paintings based on mather's and others uh work describing what the cards should look like Eight, nine, very similar, very similar. Ten, these are very similar. And there's like a radiation here that, you know, so it's so interesting to me, this, um, this whole thing. Um, so we get into the Court of Cups, here's the princesses. The Prince, Queen, and the King, or the Knight, depending on which system you're using. All right, so now we get into swords. Oops. Apparently gives us discs first. Let's get the swords. Um, they give us pentacles here too. Sorry, this one's a little out of order. Which I was not expecting. All right. So we'll look at swords next, which is generally how I go. It's wands, cups, swords, pentacles, which is just the way my first deck came in order. And so that's how I tend to do it. Um, so again, swords. Very similar. These two are very similar. So obviously more similarities between these two because they really were based on the same thing in essence. And you can see across the board in the swords. Now the benefit of this one on my left, the Wang deck, is that if you don't like the keywords, it doesn't have them. Um, so this does not have the esoteric titles on it. So that, you know, that's probably a selling point for folks um, who don't like the esoteric titles or don't want them on the cards. So there's eight. Nine. Now, if you want to see a comparison of Crowley's keywords with the Golden Dawn, if you actually watch the Pixies Pips video, I do include um, the Golden Dawn esoteric title and Crowley's keywords in there. So you can compare there. They're, they're often the same, but sometimes divergent. So here's the Ten of Swords. Um, the Princess. The Prince. Queen, whoops, goes up there, and then the king, <laughs> navigating three decks this way is harder than it looks, <laughs> all right, so then we get into discs or pentacles, so in the Golden Dawn decks it's pentacles and in Crowley it's discs, um, so you heard of the aces. Again, very, very similar in a lot of ways. All very similar. This is the cover of one of the US Games editions, I think. Three. Four. Five. 
five. Six. Seven. Eight. Definitely some similarities here. Nine. Ten. And then we get into the courts. So here's the princesses. The princes. The queens. And finally the kings. Or the knight. Um, and then the Robert Wayne deck comes with an extra card with the Tree of Life on it. This edition of the Crowley deck I do not think came with any additional cards. There are some that have older or discarded versions of the um, uh, Magician, I think. Uh, but this one just came with the Ordo Templi Orientis uh, info and then there's a name for this, which I forget, but again, um, both are described uh, in Juan Milo Tiquette's book. He also reminds us that the um, extra magician cards were not meant to be used or probably even seen. This one did not come with any extra cards other than an additional choice for temperance. Um, so those that's a walkthrough of three decks. Now, uh, you know, I mean, the, the purpose of this video is, is multifold. One is just to sort of share, talk, ramble about my experience. Um, I have not worked with these decks um, for various reasons. Uh, again, this is not a system that I, I use actively. And so the reason that they're in my collection at the moment was really for study. I got this because I wanted to explore what Crowley was doing um, through the lens of Lon Milo Duquette's book. And then I wanted to see what the uh, what he was sort of responding to. So I got this one and then I thought, well, let's look at something else. Let's make it a trio. So then I looked at the Robert Wang deck, mostly to compare these two. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, in terms of shuffling and use, I haven't shuffled these decks um, because I really got them for studying uh, and, and looking compare in comparison. But they're all mass-produced card stocks, so they're all going to shuffle the same way any. This is U.S. Games. Um, this is AGM. This is Llewellyn, but it's um, Llewellyn of the '90s slash early 2000s. I so I modern printings of this deck. I assume are similar, but I, I, I can't speak to that because again, I got this used on eBay and it was pretty cheap. So that is that. Um, a little exploration of, of a system that I really do not work with actively, um, mostly just to bring light to that and to sort of show how what I've been reading about lately. Um, actually, not even lately. This was sort of early summer, late summer. Um, uh, I've, I've actively moved into exploring uh, reading astrology, not astrology uh, in, in relationship to Tara, but actually uh, natal uh, astrology. So I'm working my way through Benabel Wen's course, um, her uh, self-study course, and um, uh, a handful of books that have been recommended to me in some YouTube videos, uh, mostly because I have some ideas of how, I, uh, how to use tarot with astrology uh, in ways that I haven't thought about before. Um, but I'll talk more about that as I learn more. And who knows, that could be years before I ever make a video about it. Because it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you're doing well. I hope this was interesting. And uh, as always, be good.